turn off all the lights and get ready to never sleep again. At my school, there's a murder club by Magpie Quill. There were two types of people at Ashbourne Intermediate School. Those who knew about the murder club and those who didn't. My little brother Elliot was among the people who didn't know. He was a sweet kid, an innocent sixth grader, the kind that took notes during advisory and got picked on endlessly by the jocks. On Thursday, he was sitting at an empty table in the lunchroom, reading a book while the other sixth graders had gone out for recess. I sat down next to him and set down my tray. What you reading? Elliot pushed up his glasses and smiled. The 13 Problems. It was on the fall reading list. It sounds boring. I think you'd like it, actually. It's a collection of murder mysteries. I've graduated from mysteries, I said, picking up my slice of pizza. Really? What's next for you, then? I took a comically savage bite of my pizza and flashed Elliot a tomato-stained grin. Real murder. Elliot laughed. I laughed with him. Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2.15 to 3 o'clock was time for club activities. Usually I would go to practice with the soccer club, but that day I had something else to do. Lingering by my locker, I tore out a sheet of notebook paper and took out a pen. I want to join the club. Ethan Trace. Being careful not to be caught by the hall monitor, I went down into the basement level and made my way over to the broom closet, where the murder club was famously rumored to meet. I folded the note and slipped it halfway through the gap under the door. A few seconds later, someone inside the broom closet took the note. I watched it slip under the door and out of sight. I felt my heart beat a little bit faster as I hurried back up the stairs and out onto the soccer field. After practice, I found a note taped to the inside of my locker. I unfolded it to reveal a short message in an unfamiliar handwriting. The only way to join the club was to kill one of us. Think of it as a rite of passage. My stomach twisted at the thought of taking someone's life, a sickening thrill that I had grimly been preparing for. I clenched my fist around the note and pressed it deep into my pocket. The game is on, I muttered. Once you were among those who knew about the murder club, it was fairly easy enough to deduce who was in it, because they mysteriously went missing during the Tuesday and Thursday club periods, and the teachers could never find them. The one I decided would be easiest to take out was Andy Bale, the silent kid in sixth grade. He shared his lunch table with the rest of the oddball freaks in Ashbourne either staring and smiling at nothing or toying with a deck of playing cards. Sometimes he held out the fanned deck to the kid sitting next to him, as if he was going to perform a magic trick. That made some people think he was in the magic club, but I checked and his name was never on the roster. On Monday, I came to school with a packet of rat poison in my backpack. Not the stuff that came in pellets, but the pure white powder that was dangerous to even breathe around. During lunch, I dumped the whole packet into a cup of water and swapped the cup with Andy's while he was looking away. Stupid kid, I thought to myself. It was like he didn't know I was coming after him. For the rest of the lunch period, I could hardly eat from the nauseating anticipation. I kept glancing at Andy's table, waiting for him to take a drink from his cup. What are you looking at? Elliot asked, peering at me quizzically. Nothing, I said quickly. I looked back to him and noticed the bruises on his cheek. What's that? Dylan Green said I was looking at Kate Michaels. Funny, he muttered. I clenched my fist. Elliot, you can't keep letting people bully you. He sighed. What do I do then? I bit my lip. I hated Elliot's bullies. They broke his glasses, broke his nose. Sometimes the cheerleaders would even make a game of breaking his heart. I tried to help him, but that only made them tease him more. 
the scrawny little nerd who needed his big brother to bail him out of trouble. Elliot looked at me expectantly, with his glasses sitting crooked on his crookedly heeled nose. There wasn't anything I could tell him, but in my head I told him to wait. Just wait until I was in the murder club. Fortunately, before the silence between us grew too long, the bustle of the lunchroom was interrupted by gagging and a loud clatter and cries of alarm. I turned my head slowly. Elliot gasped. As I directed my gaze to Andy Bale's table, I prepared a similar mock reaction of surprise. But the body on the floor wasn't Andy Bale. It was the kid who always sat next to him. Genevieve something or other. With her blonde curls splayed out on the lunchroom floor in the smear of red vomit, Andy was still in his seat, looking straight at me and grinning. I swallowed. He must have known something was in his cup. Must have switched it with Genevieve's. I berated myself for thinking he was so foolish. Of course he was ready for my move. But then, as if reading my thoughts, Andy held up his cup, still full to the brim. I looked at Genevieve's tray. She hadn't gotten a cup of water for herself, just a carton of milk that was now on the floor. Genevieve convulsed on the floor, coughing out blood-stained milk. Andy took a long drink from his cup. Then he looked back at me, smiled, and took a small, flourishing bow like a magician after his act. Sirens wailed outside the windows, and the paramedics got to the lunchroom fast, but I knew how much poison I had used. Genevieve was dead. School closed down after the incident, and Elliot told our mom and dad that maybe it was time we transferred schools, maybe to somewhere in the city. He'd brought up the topic a few times before, like when Cynthia Noki had been found floating at the bottom of a pool a couple of months ago. When Liam Adson had keeled over last summer at the ball game, and when Ricky Blake had choked to death mid presentation in March at the science fair, I had suggested switching schools too, back when I was smaller and more scared. It never worked. Our parents always shook their head and told us Ashbourne was the best school in the area in that strange, monotone voice, as if students being murdered on the monthly basis wasn't anything to be concerned about. As far as I could tell, all the other students' parents did the same. Nobody ever left Ashbourne. Not the students, not even the teachers. Some whispered that it was a curse. When school reopened, everyone who was alive was still there, while the ones who didn't know about the murder club tried to forget Genevieve's pale face and red eyes. The ones who knew discreetly turned their heads to the members of the club as they passed in the hallways. Their unspoken consensus was that the murder club had killed Genevieve, just like any other mysterious death that happened in Ashbourne. As for me, I opened my locker to find a new note taped up inside. We appreciate your service. Please try again. Jasmine McCartney in 7th grade was simply known to some as the gardener girl. If she ever made friends, she would always abandon them in favor of tending to the garden at the back of the school during lunch recess. Some people joked that she was closer with the chickens than other humans, but those people didn't know that whenever the hens in the coop grew old, it was Jasmine who slaughtered them and made chicken soup for the gardening club. I'm sure the gardening club invited her to join many times, but she never showed up unless it was for the soup. On Monday, I waited in anticipation in the garden shed, sweaty hands clasped around the handles of a long, rusted pair of gardening shears. Soon, I began to hear footsteps coming down the gravel path. I flattened myself against the wall and tried to calm my breathing. The door creaked open. As soon as I registered Jasmine's brown hair and freckles, I lunged with all my might and, just as she turned around in surprise, sank the blades of the shears six inches into her stomach. Jasmine coughed. She stumbled back and I followed her, pressing the shears deeper into her, 
trying to ignore the sickening squelching sound. Jasmine crashed against the shelves of gardening equipment and crumpled to the floor. Blood bubbled onto the dusty floor of the shed. Jasmine's eyes flitted up to me. I'm sorry. I muttered through clenched teeth, but she should have seen this coming. Jasmine's pale lips twitched. For a moment, I thought their shape resembled a smile. Why do you want to be part of the club? She breathed, a shocking calmness in her raspy voice. For Elliot, I replied. I yanked out the shears, and with one last cough, Jasmine slumped forward, dead. The shed was filled with the musty scent of blood. I wiped the shears with a rag used for drying the gardening tools and grabbed a shovel so that I could bury both. When I opened the door to leave the shed, I stumbled back as I realized someone was waiting just outside. That's a noble cause, Jasmine McCartney said, smiling. Elliot, I mean. Such a weak soul and so many people who love to hurt him. I gawked at her. At her stomach that was clean of gore, at the blood-stained rag in my hand, and finally at the floor of the shed behind me. Kevin Fisher, from the field hockey team, lay dead on the floor, blood and guts spilling out of his stomach. His wide eyes, frozen in terror, stared back up at me. I swallowed hard and slowly turned my head to look back at Jasmine. We appreciate your service. She said, smiling cheerily. Please try again. In a week's time, school had reopened again. I should have stopped my antics then. I should have been warned by the strange, unexplainable way the members of the murder club danced with death, taking the lives of two innocent people in their stead. I really should have realized that the club was using those same sinister tricks to keep me around for their entertainment. When the fingerprints on the bloody shears the investigators found buried in the garden matched with Paul Trenton instead of mine. But I couldn't stop. Not anymore. I told myself it was all for Elliot. That as a member of the murder club I could steer the club toward targeting his bullies until my little brother was finally free. A heroic cause. But more than anything now, I just wanted to take that smug grin off Andy Bale and Jasmine McCartney's faces. Not just that, I would give them a show. At the end of the week was the school play, a production of the first three acts of Julius Caesar. I planned to kill the third and final member of the murder club there. Nico Harvey was a theater kid, though he only went to after school rehearsals and never once showed up to the theater club. He sat behind me in history class, and sometimes I could almost feel him watching me. Nico laughed like a psychopath and hummed bars of Tchaikovsky at random times, habits made even creepier by his piercing stare that never broke eye contact. Despite his unsettling disposition, in the theater he ruled the stage, as if he actually possessed thousands of personalities and could adopt any of them as long as it was written in a script. In the upcoming play, he would take on the role of Julius Caesar, the glorious Roman general who would be stabbed to death by 23 senators in the accumulation of the play. I planned my moves much more carefully this time, determined not to give away where and how I had decided to strike. I snuck in and out of the backstage days before the performance avoiding the stage crew and studying the props. The daggers the senators would use to stab Caesar were designed like the classic toy used for pranks, with faux aluminum blades that retracted into the hilt when the wielder stabbed them into someone. With a few drops of superglue and a tiny bit of sharpening, the props easily became weapons enough to pierce through flesh. Early in the morning on the day of the performance, I carefully modified each of the 23 daggers and quietly slipped them back into their sheaths. Hands shaking with anticipation, I returned them to the prop table before the ready actors streamed into the backstage. The two hour long play was an agonizing wait. 
I kept glancing at Elliot, seated near the front with his fellow sixth graders. Part of my conscience seemed to come back from the cold and calculating days, as I thought about my little brother having to witness the slow, painful death I had planned for Nico Harvey. My heart beat faster and faster, and a sickening feeling settled in my gut. But by the time I was desperately wishing I could back out, it was already too late. Nico Harvey, regal and beautiful in his crimson cape and laurel crown, walked onto the stage between the cardboard pillars of the Senate for the final scene. The waiting senators unsheathed their daggers and one by one stabbed them swiftly into Nico's chest. I thought they would stop after the first sight of blood, but when the blades sank through the white linen tunic and gorged deep into warm flesh, the actors didn't so much as blink. They kept advancing, one by one, sinking their daggers into Nico Harvey, seemingly oblivious to the blood that slowly dyed his costume and streaked down his legs. And the crowd didn't stir, not even when the smell of blood drifted down the auditorium, not even when Nico staggered and fell backwards onto the stage with a wet splat. When I looked around, everyone around me was watching the stage with glossy eyes that almost looked lifeless. Nico twitched silently on the blood-stained floorboards of the stage. The 23 senators watched him without a word until his convulsion stopped and he finally fell silent. Travis Hemington, the kid playing Brutus, the traitor, slowly walked to the front of the stage and delivered his final lines in an empty voice. People and senators, be not affrightened. Fly not, stand still. Ambition's debt is paid. The curtain slid closed without a sound and the lights slowly faded to black. I jumped as the audience erupted in applause. The lights flared back on, illuminating the faces of the crowd, some teary-eyed, some delighted, some just glad the boredom of listening to Shakespeare was over. The curtains opened and the actors walked onto the spotless clean stage and began to take their bows. The last to appear was Nico Harvey, the star of the performance, as clean as the stage and healthier than ever. He took his position next to Travis Hemington, and just before he bowed to the cheering crowd, looked straight at me and grinned. I felt my blood slowly turn to ice. The rest of the school day went by in a nauseating blur. Elliot raved on the bus ride home about how amazing the play had been and how good the actors were. He never once acknowledged the blood and the daggers, like nothing unusual had ever happened. He asked me if something was wrong, but I couldn't tell him what. When I arrived home, I refused the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches our parents had made us and drifted up to my room. I pulled off my shirt and opened the closet to get a change of clothes, and when I saw what was inside, I choked back a scream. Travis Hemington, still dressed in his costume as Brutus the Traitor, was limply crumpled on the floor of my closet. His chest and sides were torn up into messy wounds, as if he had been stabbed over and over. Smeared on the back wall was a message written in blood. We appreciate your service. Please try again. I slammed the closet door shut, desperately trying to calm my breathing. The murder club was watching me. I was suddenly sure of it. I was foolish to think they would ever take their eyes off of me. I was certain they were watching even at this very moment. I stumbled around the room, looking under my bed and checking the locks on my windows, trying to ignore the crimson stain slowly spreading on the carpet beneath the closet. Then I locked my door and spent the time until sundown trying to scrub the stain from the carpet, refusing to open the closet even as more drops of blood trickled out of it onto the floor. My parents and Elliot must have noticed the paler in my face at the dinner table. They gave me concerned looks, but there was nothing I could tell them. I stuffed the mashed potatoes and peas into my mouth and retreated back upstairs. 
where I went back to frantically scrubbing at the stain that had spread through the width of the closet. Some hours must have passed until I fell asleep. I didn't even remember getting into bed, but when I woke up, I was underneath my covers. It was still dark, maybe 3 or 4 a.m., and I was hearing sounds. We appreciate your service, someone whispered. Please try again. I bolted upright, already shaking. Who's there? The voice giggled. <laughs> try again, Ethan Trace. Please, try again. I felt myself go pale. Standing at the foot of my bed were three figures, with three sets of teeth that glowed in the moonlight as they grinned down at me. Andy Bale, Jasmine McCartney, and Nico Harvey gathered around me, regarding me like hawks circling prey. Cradled in Jasmine's arms was a fourth figure, small and thin. Elliot. I gasped. What? What did you do to him? Jasmine giggled. Nothing, she said. <laughs> Nothing yet. What do you want from me? Nico smirked. Well, you still want to join the club, don't you? What do you people call it? The murder club? No. No, please. Just leave me alone. That's a pity, Nico said, grinning coldly. I would hate for anything to happen to your brother. Elliot groaned, stirring in his sleep. Andy reached out his fingers and softly stroked his hair. Don't touch him! I cried. Jasmine beamed. So you'll try again? Try again? Yeah, it's been great fun playing with you. We'd hate for you to quit. And besides, Nico mused. You might finally get one of us someday. You might kill one of us, once and for all. And when that happens, who knows? He chuckled, a sound that chilled my bones. Maybe then you'll finally learn the real secrets of our club. There were three types of people at Ashbourne Intermediate School. Those who knew about the murder club those who didn't, and me. Travis Hemington's body was gone without a trace in the morning. Even the sand on the carpet had vanished, as it, it had never been there at all. Elliot complained about some bad dreams he had as the school bus rumbled over dirt roads. I think I saw Jasmine McCartney, he said. She was the only good part. She had flowers in her hair and she was holding a chicken from the garden in her arms. I nodded absently. She's really pretty. Elliot sighed. Do you think she would talk to me if I said hello? We appreciate your service. Please try again. We appreciate your service. Please try again. Please try again. Please try again. Please try again. Their laughters echoed through my head their pitiful mockery of smiles flashing before my eyes. I pressed my hand onto my pocket, feeling the weight of the switchblade I had taken from my father's drawer. Yeah, I said meekly. I have a feeling she likes you already. Greetings, spoils and ghouls. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more, subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss out. If you have a request or suggestion, make sure to leave them in the comment section below. We hope you enjoyed this video, and remember to stay spooky.